That's great. The Quran is guidance. The Quran is a miracle. What about me? What do I do? You see, there are three kinds of people. And I'm taking this from a great work of tafsir written by Amin Ahsan Islahi. You should read his introduction of the Dabur al Quran. Those of you who can read Urdu, those of you who can't read Urdu, uh, the first volume has been translated called Pondering Over the Quran. Uh, uh, pondering Over the Quran. Uh, the translator I don't know, but the author is Amin Ahsan Islahi. Amin Ahsan Islahi. So he says there are three kinds of people. Once they acknowledge that the Quran is guidance, there are three kinds of believers. The first kind is the one who says, you know, Allah actually is giving me guidance in this book. And if I come across some, guide, some knowledge of this book that is guiding my life in a different direction, I'm going to change myself. I'm going to try to change my life according to the dictates of this guidance. Because you start reciting this Quran and learning it and memorizing it and studying it and you start realizing that this Quran is offering a lifestyle that's going this way and your lifestyle is going that way. So you got to start changing some stuff. So the way you speak starts changing. The way you dress starts changing. The way you eat starts changing. The way the kinds of friends you have starts changing. The kind of job you have starts going through change. The kind of money you make starts changing. The interaction you have with your family starts changing. And when this change starts happening, the first people to notice are who? Your family. And your mother, your sister, your brother, your cousin. They come to you and you say, you're changing, man. Are you okay? I mean, we're all Muslim. You don't have to be that Muslim. Which, you know, are you listening to these mullahs or something? Is that what's happening to you? Take the thing off your face. They'll come to the, the daughter. The father will come to the daughter. Why are you wearing that on your head? You're not going to go out like that, right? This is America. Don't do that. Who's going to marry you looking like that? They're going to take you away. Looking at your beard. They will say things like that. Your family. They're not going to say these things to you because they hate you, by the way. You know why they're saying those things? Because they love you. And they're scared for you. They think you're becoming crazy. And that's nothing new. Whenever people started turning to their faith, what do their families consider? Insanity as the only possibility. <laughs> and so what happens, especially the young people here, listen up. When you start turning a little bit religious, a little too religious than the rest of your family, or the parents start turning more religious than their kids, when that happens, then those that are not moving at your pace are waiting, patiently waiting, until you get a C on your test. Until one time you snap at your father. And then they'll turn around and say, is this what your Islam teaches you? It is that it's this, all this masjid stuff, that's why you got a C. That's why you failed. All you, you know, so they're waiting for your mistake. To blame what? The religion. And when this is going on, this psychological war that's going on in your home, you walk into your home and it's a war zone. It's a war zone. Your mother, your wife, your, hus you know, your husband, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your uncle, whoever they are, they are saying the most hurtful, sarcastic, poisonous things that if anybody else said, you would run them over with your car, but then you have to take it from them because they're your family and eventually young man, 18, 19, 20, you know you're known to be hot-blooded anyway, so what do you do? You snap. You people are trying to make me follow the forefathers and the culture and I'm trying to follow the sunnah and you don't even have the right aqidah. Slam the door and walk out. It happens. It Certainly doesn't. No, it didn't. <laughs> but I've seen it happen. And even if it did, I wouldn't tell you. So <laughs> <laughs> but this happens. My family just doesn't understand. And now you start attending halaqat and classes and courses. Not because you want to attend classes and halaqat and courses, because you can't handle what's going on at home. And you just want to be away. Seriously, check yourself. Check yourself. You see, that is the biggest failure of our youth. You have to grow thicker skin. You have to grow thicker skin. You got to be able to take it. Whatever they dish out, whatever they say, I wish you were never born. Is this why we brought you to America? <laughs> right? Whatever they say, it's okay. Smile. Be the best to your parents. Be the best to your parents. Whatever they're doing, they can't be worse off than the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
who's manufacturing shit products for mass distribution. And he's kicking his son, who's right, out of the house. A lot of times youth tell me, oh man, my parents just don't get it, man. They don't understand. So what if they don't get it? That's not the point. The point is, if you're holding on to this guidance, then you gotta have thick skin. There are people that came before us that were buried alive because they believed. You can't take some, some yelling from your parents. You can't take some sarcastic comments from your uncles every eve. Oh, we know what you were like last year. What happened this year, Malvi Sahib? Right? They'll say that. Take it. People before us took a lot worse. Thank Allah we got it easy. Thank Allah these are not the times where believing is like holding coal. The Messenger warned us about that, right? Thank Allah that it's not like that. People think, people are always ungrateful. And we are ungrateful because we don't have sabr. Sabr and shukr go together. When you're not patient, you start complaining. And if the fact that you're complaining is a sign that you're not grateful. Allah is giving you these opportunities to grow your personality, to become forbearing. And you know, I give you advice, when you take guidance seriously, especially young man and young woman, and you're having trouble at home, do more at home. Skip the class. Vacuum the house. Get your mom some flowers. Massage her feet. You know, prepare the taxes for your father. Do something. So instead of associating rebellion with Islam, what do your parents associate with Islam? Service. Better character, better behavior. Don't, don't, don't do it the other way around. So anyway, the first people that turn on you are the people who love you the most. And that's the hardest thing to deal with. It could be from your spouse, it could be from your children, it could be from your parents, it could be from anywhere. But it's a hard thing to deal with, because they're always there. You always have to deal with them, and you have to keep your best relations with them, right? Then the next step, after that, you start losing your friends. It gets even worse. What happens is, you know, before you turn to the religion, you go out with your friends, watch a movie, you know, go do some hookah or something. A lot of guys do that in New York, right? Or, you know, uh, go hang out, worse. But after you turn to the deen, you don't want to waste your time. So you don't hang out as much. And when you don't hang out as much, they're not your friends anymore. So on the one hand, your family's turned on you. On the other hand, you lost your friends. And on the third side, you realize your income is haram, so now you lost your money too. So it seems like when you turn towards this guidance, everything that was a source of joy in your life has now turned into a source of pain. From every direction. And this is the ultimate psychological test. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you can hold out this test and ride this difficulty, then Allah gifts you with the ultimate gift. You know what that is? That is real iman. That is an appreciation for guidance. Because you paid something for it with your pain. And it is after you pass through this test, that something changes inside your personality. Now, after this change, after this test, you find calmness in your prayer. You don't say, oh man, I just prayed, I gotta do it again. You don't think like that anymore. Now you seek the prayer. Instead of the prayer having to come knock on your door, you're knocking doors on the prayer. It's the other way around, because there's something changed in your personality. You are inclined towards obedience to Allah. You don't find it a burden anymore. And then Allah starts opening these doors that you couldn't even imagine. He starts opening these doors. He starts introducing you to people. You start replacing old friends with much, 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 much better friends. And He does this all because you decided that you want to take the guidance seriously. Taking the guidance seriously is not a joke. You go through a lot of hard times. Be mentally prepared for it. أَحَسِبَ nas أَنْ يُطْرَكُوا People think that they're gonna just say that they believe and they're gonna be they're not gonna be put to test. No 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 no. We thoroughly tested the people before them. We did. None of us is gonna be free from this test. This is the first kind of people who go through these tests and pass. And this is the minority of people we ask Allah to make us from them. The second kind of people who say yes, Quran is guidance. Yes, it's a miracle. Yes, it's saying the right thing. I just can't do it, man. I don't know how you do it. You get people that come to you and say, Hey, you pray five times? Yeah? That's awesome, man. Every day? On time? I could never do that. That's so awesome that you do that. I wish I could do that. Make dua for me. That Allah gives me tawfiq. Right? 
So now, have you ever heard this by the way? I can't do it? I don't know how you do it, that's so awesome. Right? Allah blessed you especially, He didn't bless me especially. By the way, the prayer, which is the bare minimum, the, in the, on the practical life of a Muslim, the bare minimum is the prayer, is the equivalent of like the, the law, like breaking the law is criminal, right? This is the law of Islam, so not praying is criminal behavior. You don't go to someone and say, hey man, you, you stop at every red light? Every one of them? <laughs> every day? Oh man, I could never do it. You don't think like that. Because you acknowledge that that's the law. And you just don't break the law. And if you do, you're criminal. Right? But our mentality about the prayer has changed. Anyhow, the people who say that they don't have the ability to do so, don't even realize that they are uttering a blasphemy. They're saying something blasphemous against Allah Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says multiple times in His book, لا يكلف الله نفسا Allah does not burden any person. Allah does not place a burden upon any person. إلا ما أتاها إلا وسعها إن بقرة Except by its capacity. That person's capacity. Meaning, in other words, practically, if Allah put a burden on me, the only possibility is Allah knew already that I am capable of carrying that burden. Otherwise, Allah says He would never put a burden on someone who is not able to carry it. So if Allah put the burden of the prayer, put the burden of avoiding the haram, put the burden of fulfilling the fara'id, put the burden of these things on me, that by definition means that I am capable. There is no extra capability that I don't have that somebody else has which is keeping me. Allah made me inherently capable. It is only my excuses. So either you're telling the truth when you say I can't, or Allah is telling the truth when He says you can. You're accusing Allah Azza wa of something you shouldn't. You understand? So that's the second kind of person. And then there's finally there's the third kind of person. The first kind of person who commits to change. The second kind of person, the excuse maker. The third kind of person who claims to commit to change. Who talks a lot about the change, but actually doesn't change. And to compensate for not changing, what he or she does is, he or she becomes extremely outspoken. And that's all there, all that noise is there to compensate for what's missing in action. Okay? You know the leader of the Munafiqun, La'anahullah, Abdullah ibn Ubayy, before the Prophet would get up for khutbah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would get up before him. Oh people, this is the Messenger of Allah. We should listen to him carefully. Thanks, but we already knew that. <laughs> He's not saying that because that's an important message. He needs the mic time. He needs to show everyone that he is committed. And he has to say it in such emphatic terms. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ When the hypocrites come to you, they say, we bear witness. You are so definitely, truly, you're really the messenger of Allah. When you say something like that, then what are you hiding? You're not really sure he's the messenger of Allah. Wallahu <laughs> ya'lamu Allah knows you're his messenger, by the way. Allah also knows. Allah testifies they're lying. They don't, they don't mean it when they say it. So the hypocrite, what he does is he hides. He hides his lack of change with words. Just words, empty words. And I'm not saying this so you think, yeah, I could think of two people in this community that fit that, yeah. And before I forget, I should probably write their names down. No, that's not why I'm saying it. Because the, the, the problem of hypocrisy, the thing about it in our deen is, hypocrisy is a measure not for you to judge anyone but yourself. The only time you should be thinking about hypocrisy is never for anyone else, always for yourself. For anyone who says, La ilaha illallah, we have this fail-safe, this mechanism, this security system called khusnul dhan. We make the best assumption about the other. We make the best assumption about the other. Benefit of the doubt under all circumstances. Under all circumstances. 